Welcome everybody. My name is Niels, as you said. Um, I know you get free beer for coming here. Uh, I've got the deal that if I shut up after 20 minutes, I get free beer as well. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do now is basically just give you a brief introduction into uh, the world of microservices, and then I'm going to put on the editor and we're going to do some live coding while we're here, basically. Um, so, for the last 20 years or so, the best thing we could come up with as an architecture is a three-tiered architecture. Cons you just listen to the narration and you'll get everything, okay? Uh, basically consisting of a data layer, uh, which was once a relational database but moved into many other kinds of scenarios, and uh, a service layer and some kind of UI layer. If any of you have been uh, developing Java applications for the last 20 years, you must know at least 20, 25 Java web frameworks to use in that scenario. Or if anybody says struts, now's the time to run. Um, the thing is that uh, from a technical point of view, we, uh, we look at a, a, a very large uh, product, which is basically a, a very monolithic kind of block in which we put all our applications and all our software development for a long, long time. Now, uh, if we turn that a bit around and look at any kind of application that we produce, always has some kind of view that always goes for the user. Nowadays, we're looking at very um, what's known as a kind of a single page application or uh, applications that are very thin on UI. Um, but if you look at any kind of thing, this is an example from a very famous something shop. Um, and if you really, really look into what is in there and stop looking at the technical part and looking at a functional specification, you will see that if you look at uh, up in the top, you can search for products, which requires that your search is very, very fast if you've got many, many products. Uh, you can find products and descriptions of those, and you can even order those, put them in it into a basket and some kind of procurement system. Now, uh, the, the, the way we've been dealing with this so far for the last 20 years has been to build one giant app because the users see this, this is one giant app, or the, or, or the company owners would say, this is one big app. Let's put everything in there. Now, that doesn't scale, uh, especially not when we're looking at uh, the options that we have today for scaling out, and why does it always have to be that everything needs to be in the same a monolithic application. Right, so that's the general idea of saying, how, why don't we take parts of the application that's in here, slice it up a bit from a functional perspective, from a uh, user perspective, and see what kind, of, uh, what kind of scenario we get here. If you're looking at something like this, well, you could cut it and slice it and dice it in many different ways. Um, if you look at the application for searching, what we really have there, what we need to have there is the basic uh, idea of having a title and an author to search for an ISBN or something, but it needs to be extremely fast, so it's probably not a relational third normalized model that we're working on, but something else probably. Um, product details is a very good model for itself, and uh, shopping baskets are is basically um, its own kind of territory in there. So the idea is really to, to kind of look at any kind of functionality from a user perspective and say, hey, there's an app for that, right? So we're back to the iPhone, but this time on the web. So if we slice and dice any kind of application and say there is basically any kind of functionality in there we can build up and run up as a uh, small application. So we have one application for producing the client basket, uh, one for producing the add to wish list, one for the recommendation, one for the marketplace, and so on and so on. Simply breaking up the single application into many, many small applications, making it much more resilient and much easier to utilize. Right. In the words of Martin Fowler, basically, he says, well, basically, you want a, you want a single app, uh, a, a small little entity you can run up, and that's basically your, uh, your system as a whole. That's kind of the core concepts of microservices covered very, 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 very briefly. Um, and the flip side to having uh, microservices at the moment is that having a lot of small services provides a... Uh, a stream verbose of uh, operational concepts, basically. All the orchestration of microservices is, is really hard to work with. Um, and you end up having to build the same kind of application over and over again, right? So if we pick any kind of application, say, oh, we, we want a database, we want a web something service uh, that could do some rest, we constantly have to work with boilerplate and adding things in here uh, that basically needs to be configured. 
that was a very short uh, five minutes microservices. So, duplication of efforts. Why am I talking about Spring Boot here? Well, Spring Boot offers basically the idea that um, getting from zero to hero should basically, well, from, from scratch to some kind of workable application should take less than 20 minutes, right? So here's 15 minutes uh, to prove this. Uh, build from the fact that basically anything you want to build, there's a convention for that. Uh, and you can basically just plug it in and it'll configure itself for the most default scenario that you're going to have, right? Build on top of a framework called Spring MVC, Spring JPA, Spring Data, et cetera, et cetera. I presume that you have heard the word Spring before. It means that kind of year we're in now, so something like that. So what I'm going to do now is basically switch over to the editor and we're going to start some, some live coding, okay? And I'll start from mostly from scratch, uh, just to be sure, and internet and all that. What I've started with, I actually went to the Maven site and downloaded um, the arch type. Oh, I think I have it on this one here. Maven arch type generate, generate a project, spring boot, take the simple one. That's where I'm gonna start off and say, what is actually the core concepts that goes into a spring application? Why does it handle for me all the things that makes an application run in less than 10 minutes, right? As we clearly see here on the left-hand side, you'll, there we go. Uh, right, so this is Maven. If you're frightened of that, that's okay. You can do it in Gradle as well. I'm just, I'm just a dinosaur, so I'll still hang on to this. Um, so the core thing is that if you're ever gonna depend on something, it's gonna be as few things as possible. So what I'm gonna depend on is uh, the Spring Boot. And what I'm gonna depend on is the Spring Boot test because I wanna test my application. Sometimes you can basically delete that, but that's basically it. The third thing that's in my project is a Maven plugin. Right. That's the sample application. Question? Oh, I've tried. I've tried, and it's going to be hard uh, because I have hardly any projector size. So, um, so I'll, I'll do an attempt anyway. We'll just take a few seconds for that. Here we go, and we go font 18. And you should be able to see something here. Better? No? Well, sorry, that's the way it goes. I'm not really good with technology, you know. <laughs> right. So, why do I depend on this, and what does it actually give me that I'm kind of looking at? Right. So the core idea is to lean on standards and get everything convention over configuration. So if I ever look at what I'm um, actually importing, Spring Boot, you can't see anything, can you? Spring Boot builds on three things. A, it builds on Spring, the framework itself. B, the fact that it can auto-configure, right? So it can look in your context for beans. If they are there, it'll use them. If it's not there, it's gonna define some standards, all right? So that's the convention part. And the third part of it is what you need for any kind of application you're gonna build, you're gonna have some locking of some kind, right? So that's the core concepts that are going in there and saying these are the core things that we have in there. The second part is that it actually provides a plugin for my Maven. And starting off from that, uh, looking at the project, if I ever, ever try to build a project from that, a small sample here, You'll see it's a, it's a regular project, and I basically just compile it, and you'll see that there is only one extra plugin in here, which basically repackaged my application, right? Because one of the core things about starting an application is there's so many jars, there's so many things that I need to bundle, there's so many things I need to move out there, right? So what we actually get from this is the fact that, it's called that one, we get a jar full of whatever we produce, as source code, and then we also get all the libraries that we need, and an incredibly nice little bootloader that can take our jar file and make it in, into an executable. So from the sample application, I'll be able to just basically say, I want to run my application by just invoking the jar file, right? I'll show the application in a few seconds. It doesn't do much, but Everything you need to launch the application from one single command line is in there, one of the key points for the microservice. Um, as you can see here, all the application does is actually saying hello on system out, so it's not really that much in there. What makes a Spring Boot application? 
Well, here's my main method. It says spring application dot run, and then it provides the name of the class that we have here. Now, it's a spring class. It's annotated with the configuration class. So it says that basically what we can do here is treat this as a spring bean and a configuration. So we can define any kind of beans that we want, and they'll be discovered. But the, the thing here that's different from any other kind of spring application is, is the fact that you enable an auto configuration, right? So what this application, what this means is if there's any choice that I should make as a developer, there is already made one for me that I can choose from, right? So if I don't specify anything, uh, I can use this. The application doesn't do much. You see all it does is actually invoke a service, and all that service does is really saying hello to whoever is configured in the configuration file. Right. So what do I want to do with this? Well, the first thing I want to do is basically turn it into a REST service, because that's kind of how I communicate with the rest of the world. So if I ever take this dependency and say, well, actually, I want to do some web development, so I'll just add the Spring Boot starter that contains all the web stuff. Now, that means that it takes a lot of choices for me already. So if I ever basically start my uh, application, if I package it and run it, you'll, you'll quickly realize from the output of the application that a lot of choices has already been included simply by beans specified as auto configuration in my class. Can you see more of this here? The, the things to look for is, is it might start the application, but if you look at it, it's also starting a Tomcat application server, and it's generating a web application context for me, and everything I need to do, basically, and it starts up on port 8080 um, for me, right? A lot of um, opinionated choices. That's what we're here for. So is it hard to create some kind of a REST, con REST service here? So. We're just going to duplicate the hello world, so I'm just going to do a hello world controller here and say that is going to be my REST controller, right? Spring Bean, Spring MVC is in here for me, and I can start doing all the things that I want to do. I write one simple method like this, and I say whatever maps to slash on my web server needs to invoke this method and returns what's here. Now we're in Spring context, and I already had another class in there that could say hello to me, so there's some kind of hello world service that I can use. Something like this. Right. So the only opinionated choice I said, I want to do a web project, I specified a REST controller and a mapping for slash, basically. And if you see when it starts up, it basically makes sure that I have a Tomcat, I have it running on port 8080, and it maps everything I need to have, including uh, favorite icons and so on, and expose that as a service somewhere around, not there, there. So you see, the point of getting an application up and running in 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 very, very short span of time is right there with a lot of opinionated choices. Now, if I don't like the choices, what I could do is basically reconfigure in Spring way that I want something else, and it'll be in there for me. This is part of my application. What I'm kind of, kind of working at is that most applications want to work with a database of some kind. So uh, what we're going to do is Go back here and says, oh, another thing I want to do is work with a database. And actually, I want to use JPA, which is a nice standard way of accessing a relational database. Uh, and by saying this, I basically say to Spring, oh, by the way, I want to run something where I have my database and a JPA layer. So it'll auto-configure a hibernate for me and, uh, and include all the libraries that I need here for this kind of thing, right? All I have to specify, basically, is some kind of database. 
Um, so I'm just going to include my jar file for my database in this case, or my database driver. In this case, the uh, HSQL database. Now, convention over configuration. So if you want to start up with an uh, towards a database, clearly somewhere in your Spring context, you must have all the Hibernate stuff, a persistence unit, and uh, a data source of some kind that you can connect to. All right? And the idea is that if you specify a data source, that's the one we're going to use. If you're not, well, if you, can, um, if you don't specify anything else, well, here's a HSQL database, so we'll give you an in-memory database, right? That's a nice opinion choice. So if your database is in HSQL or uh, Darby or H2, it'll automatically configure itself to be an in-memory database. Now, we don't want that. So if you don't like the defaults, it's very, very easy in, in Spring Boot to change it to anything else that you want to do. Spring Boot can use, contains a simple property file. You can rename it, change the name to something else, but one property file for your application in which you specify the environments. And that, that, that single file is the one you keep outside of the jar to basically say, this is my dev development environment, this is my test environment, and so on and so on. So all I basically have to say is, oh, I'm, I'm going to run on HSQL, but I'm using the file-based edition, and these are the drivers and so on. So I specify my own data source and, and basically run up my application again. Now, when the application loads at this point, you'll notice that it's actually setting up a uh, persistence unit because I want to talk to the database. It's mapping everything up using Hibernate, apparently. Um, and if we ever look at the output here, you should have noticed that if I save the file and run it, it'll create the database for me in the file system. It took the default and used an in-memory database for me. Right. So, let's add some stuff in there. So we're just going to add some simple kind of model in there. So, since this is an IMOS application, so you're all participants in here, so we'll just create an entity, which is uh, everybody in here. So we can register every one of you with a ID. Right. And that will be something like, it needs to have an ID. In this case, it's probably just a generated value, which is probably fine. And I could do all sorts of JPA annotations. These are hardly any Spring Boot, but we'll just keep them in there anyway. Here's an entity, right? And uh, since this is uh, Hibernate and it's default, so, uh, given that this one is here, it'll use in development mode the standard thing where we're going to just create or drop and create the database so the entities gets in there. So it's going to create the schema for me and put it into the database. Apart from that, I can also just say, well, once you do start populating the database, what I really want to do is put some default data in there. So I'm just going to add a file in my resources directory called import SQL and it just say insert into participant ID name email something like that values here we are at logitech.dk something like that right now another thing of using spring is that you get a lot of things for granted so um, the Spring Data interface makes it very easy for me to create a service which is participant repository. There you go. So we're going to do some simple create repository. There we go. Right, 
And uh, simply by extending this interface, Spring is capable of, of writing basically all the methods that I need for, sem for standard CRUD behavior. So that includes counts and deletes and finds and saves and whatever I want for our participants. So that's my interface. All I need now is a controller for my REST service. What I'm going to do is I'm just basically too lazy. So copy paste still works. Participant controller. There we go. Let's say we're going to use a auto wired repository repo. There we go. And this one, basically, we're just going to map on participants. Let's show all. There we go. Change that. Excellent. And delete that one. So basically, uh, that's me writing the database and uh, the entities and the queries and most of the things that I need, all up to the REST service that basically lists them. When I get to this part, you'll notice from the boot that it'll, it'll create all the schema for me and add everything in, as well as the, the, the REST URLs that I need in there. Something like that. And you can easily see that I can easily um, get my database up and running, and I've spent almost almost 10 minutes for it, right? So um, the core idea is that inside Spring and Spring Boot are a lot of very good choices for generating a lot of uh, stuff very fast. Now, the idea here is that it's all configured for you with a, with a standard configuration that basically defaults to a lot of things that you would want to use. Now, if you ever specify something else, if I specify another data source, then that's the one I'm going to use. If I specify another embedded web server, that's the one it's going to use, and so on and so on. Um, this one basically says that I have ah, two minutes left. So with two minutes left, uh, the, the final thing to do is, well, basically, since that, I can more or less uh, take my application, build it as a single jar, and execute that jar. Well, if you ever kind of work with a single container, container system, I don't know, kind of Docker, I think people will say Docker later. Well, here's kind of the way of getting the project up and running, basically. So you just start a Java image at the application and run the Java command, and that's your service up and running in the cloud, basically. If you're into uh, Heroku or whatever it's called, um, you basically just write a simple proc file saying, oh, by the way, once you've compiled the project, run a Java minus jar on your target. And you notice the application.properties, well, they're basically read from the command line from the system environment or some other property file that you may specify. So in this case, we basically take the port and pass it straight in anyway. So. As I promised earlier, it's not going to take more than 20 minutes because otherwise I won't get any beer. So with this in mind, what I've done is I've gone from zero to an application that basically has a database and all the participants in it, except for the methods for handling it, REST service and build it in one jar, easy to deploy on the interweb. That's Spring Boot for you. Thank you. <laughs>